Hi, everyone. This week, we will talk about convolutional neural networks in the second part of our deep learning or computer vision lecture series. Last week, we discussed first the motivation for studying deep learning methods for computer vision. And we said that for a very large challenge called ImageNet, deep learning methods yielded the highest accuracies ever. Since 2012, there has been quite a number of efforts in making deep learning architectures better in several vision tasks, including recognition for the ImageNet challenge. And today, as we said, neural networks or multi-layered neural networks, um, they're an essential component in computer vision and image analysis used in various tasks, um, enhancement, detection, segmentation, recognition, and many more. Last week, we talked about the introduction. This week, we will talk about convolutional neural networks. We will study the basic application of deep learning to image analysis and computer vision. And the next three weeks, we will go even deeper into this topic. So just a recap from what we saw last lecture on the introduction. We saw this on the right, we saw this architecture, and we said that, well, a current deep learning architecture, a fully connected one, was an extension of the multi-layered perceptron. Um, basically, we had an input. The input was transformed by a linear transformation and then a nonlinearity fed to the next layer. And then we repeat the same process again and again until we go to the output. If we were to look at it in a function view, the entire neural network could be written in terms of a function like this. So x is my input, theta are the parameters of my neural network, and f is the function that it defines. So the very first transition to going to the first layer, x is the input, f1 of x gives me the result of the first hidden layer, f2 of the result gives me the result of the second hidden layer, and so on, until we basically apply the transition from the last hidden layer to the output with f sub the capital L. The parameters, well, each transition between layers had parameters, and these parameters, basically, we tuned um, based on minimizing an error on a training set. We always considered x as a vector so far. And the question we want to answer this week is what to do when x is an image. The naive approach would basically take an image and notice that a vector of features is basically a one-dimensional vector, while an image is a two-dimensional array. At each point, we have pixels. And these boxes, they represent, for instance, the pixels. And inside each box, we can have the gray level. Or you can even think about having three different values inside each box, for instance, for the RGB images. Now, a very naive implementation would basically take this entire image and simply vectorize it. The vectorized version would then go into the multi-layered neural network that we've seen from last week. So nothing really changes there. This vectorization would be, for instance, first I take the first column, put it up here. Then underneath, I take the second column and put it under that, and so on. So that would be the vectorization. If I have multiple channels, like RGB channels per pixel, then I would do the vectorization again like that too. So the first three elements would be the RGB um, intensities for the first pixel. The next three would be the RGB for the second pixel, and so on. Now, this naive approach is obviously feasible, but there are certain problems with it. There are actually three main problems that tell us that we should not use this naive approach, but we should basically devise something more clever. Now, the very basic linear transformation that a simple layer um, defines has two big issues. One of them is a fully connected layer, a fully connected link, leads to too many parameters if the input size is very large. Assume that we basically put an imp input image of size n0 and m0. Right? So x is now not a feature vector, but it's an image n0 and m0. So if I basically uh, vectorize it, then you can imagine that the dimension will be n0 times m0. If I have a hidden layer of size d sub 1, then the connection matrix that links to input to the first hidden layer will have d1 times n0 times m0 elements. Now, this can be quite large, even for a small image. 
Let's have an example. If we look at an image of size 64 by 64, and if we have a hidden layer of size 128, we can easily compute that this leads to more than half a million parameters only in the first layer. If you consider further layers, the number of parameters will increase. Furthermore, I basically have 64 times 64 pixels. That's actually quite a large number. Then I reduce it to 128. I create a huge bottleneck. Remember from last week that if we created such bottlenecks, we actually lost the ability to represent very complex decision boundaries. So we are prone to such errors here. Obviously, it's very difficult to visualize such boundaries, but we can take motivation from what we've seen last week. We saw that even uh, with a two-dimensional input, if we reduce the dimension in the first hidden layer to one, we were not able to accurately create a decision boundary. We were able to do it if we, for example, increased the dimension hidden layer into three. And here we have a huge reduction in the dimension from the input to the first hidden layer. So there's a huge compression of dimension plus half a million parameters. Now, you can imagine having a larger hidden layer here. For example, instead of 64 times 64, you can say 64 times 64 times 2, for instance. But notice that that will create an enormous amount of parameters, much, much, much larger than half a million. The second part is this is actually really not a good strategy because images are composed of hierarchy of local statistics. So let's look at the example here, what I mean by this. If I look at an image here, and let's assume that my task is pixel-wise segmentation, meaning that I will take these images and at each pixel I will assign to a class. For instance, the pixel under the cursor here will belong to a person, the pixel here will belong to a light post, uh, the pixel here that will belong to a building, the road, the car, the tree, and so on. Now, if I want to decide on the class assignments of these pixels, for this person. Obviously, they should rely on each other and the boundaries, right? Like, if I decide that this is a person pixel, probably the information around this pixel is very important. And if I want to decide that this is a boundary between the human and the building or the road, then the surrounding here is very important. You can even imagine that to be able to decide that this is a human pixel, you have to look at the entire human shape to decide. It's possible. But it's very unlikely that the decisions here actually rely on the decisions here. I mean, this human can be anywhere. You don't necessarily need to know that there's a light post to the left-hand side of this human to decide that this pixel is actually belongs to the human. So that doesn't work. So you see, actually, there are really local areas of statistics that should be gathered. And there's a hierarchy of statistics that should be gathered. And if you do a fully connected layer, you simply link this pixel to this pixel and to this pixel, all of them together, to make a final decision for each pixel in the image. So that's not a very good strategy. And the third problem is a lack of invariance. When I show an image like this, a lack of translation invariance, when I show you the image on the left, and I ask you what number do you see in this image, I'm hoping most of you will say two. Now, if I show you the image on the right-hand side and ask you whether this also has a 2 or what number this image has, the answer doesn't change. Actually, the number 2, the specific image of the number 2 here and here are exactly the same. But there is a translation in between. Now, you want an algorithm that basically is invariant to this translation. You shouldn't really care if I'm trying to decide what number I see in this image. But notice that if I have a fully connected layer, then this image is completely different than this image because the vectorized version of this image will have a very different profile than the vectorized version of this image. So feeding them as input to a fully connected network will really result in very different activations in the first hidden layer and therefore very different activations in the subsequent hidden layers. So what's our strategy? We have this fully connected architecture. So at a given hidden layer, L minus 1, to be able to compute the activations of the next layer, L, we basically multiplied the neurons, each of them. So 
Ej is multiplied by a weight vector, and that gives me the hidden layers, or uh, the activation of a neuron in the next hidden layer. So I have the weights and I have the biases. We will change this architecture into a convolutional architecture. And in a very abstract level, the only difference we will make is instead of having a multiplication here, we will instead have a convolution. Now, this obviously needs a lot more to discuss, and this will change the structure of the hidden layer itself. This will change the structure of the weight matrix, and this will change the structure of the activation. Let's see how that works. Now, the nonlinearity will remain the same. There is nothing really changing there. So actually, the only thing that changes is how I compute the activations. In the fully connected layer, that was basically a matrix vector product. While in a convolutional architecture, that will be a convolution operation. And we will see how it's done. But afterwards, the nonlinearity, remember that in a, even in a fully connected layer, the nonlinearity was applied pixel-wise, or sorry, it was applied neuron-wise. So the output of this matrix times vector product is simply a big um, vector, and the nonlinearity was applied to each of its components independently. And it will be the same thing here as well. This activation will have a certain structure, and the nonlinearity will be applied to each of its components independent from each other. So let's deep Let's dig a little deeper and try to understand what these convolution layers are. First, let's try to remember what convolution is. Let's assume that I have this image here. Now, in this image, I basically show you a matrix of um, intensity values. So underneath the gray values there, they actually represent intensities. And in each of these um, intensities, I also show, show you the intensity value. So just a numerical value. of it. So let's assume that this is my image and this is my convolutional kernel. And I don't show you the weights of the convolutional kernel, but simply its structure. So it's a three by three convolution kernel. Remember, the convolution operator was simply given by this. So I put the convolutional kernel on the image, multiply the kernel value with the underlying pixels, and sum them up. So in this case, this kernel location will multiply 544, this will multiply 552, 570, and so on. And then I will simply sum them up to get the result, for instance, for the central pixel, if my kernel is central. I go through the entire image to basically get a result of the convolution. Now, let's be a bit more pragmatic. Uh, sorry, let's dig a little bit deeper and uh, go through the convolution one by one, because we will see that actually the size of the images change, which will later be a topic of discussion um, in the coming hour. So I have my image here and I have my convolution kernel here. I don't show any of the pixel intensities in any of them or the weights of the kernel. How do I do convolution? First, I place the kernel on top of the top, um, on the top left corner of the image. I multiply the kernel values with the underlying pixel intensity, sum them up, and I get the resulting value. Let's call it A. So A is the first result of my convolution, and that's the first pixel. Then I simply move the kernel one pixel to the right, do exactly the same operation, and get the result B. Do the same thing, get the result C, and then I will do uh, go down and do exactly the same thing until I basically go with the kernel through the entire image. And then I get this result. Now notice that I started with a 5x5 five five image, and when I applied the convolution kernel, I got a 3x3 three three result, because I could only fit the kernel inside the image completely at a 3x3 three three area. I couldn't fit it. If I were to put the center of the kernel here, I noticed that a part of the kernel would remain outside where intensities are not defined. So this is actually where I could only fit the kernel to. And this is what we will call the valid convolution. So basically, I only compute the result of the convolution where the operation is validly defined. OK, so this is the basic convolution operation. So what does it mean using convolutions instead of projections? What exactly changes in the architecture? Now, when we were using the fully connected layers, meaning projections or linear projections, each uh, H L minus 1j is actually a number. 
So a given um, hidden layer was composed, for example, of some number of neurons. And HL minus 1, J, is the Jth neuron in the L minus 1 layer. And that was a number. And so is the resulting activation of the next layer. So A, L sub K is basically the activation of um, Kth neuron in the L layer. If I put together all the neurons in a, neur uh, in a hidden layer, I basically get a vector. So each HL, each hidden layer, was simply a vector of numbers, a vector of neurons. And each activation is simply a vector of activation. And the connection between the activation and the neuron uh, value was basically the nonlinearity. So I basically feed the activation into a nonlinearity to get the values in the hidden layer. Now there's a separate link, WLKJ, that is linking each neuron, H as subject, to each ALK. So if I take two layers side by side, each neuron in the previous layer is connected to each neuron in the next layer by a separate weight value. The high dimensions of the neurons in the subsequent layers led to a high number of weights. Now, when it comes to the convolution, we will see that actually each L minus 1 J is now not a number, but it is an image of neurons. So that's a very big shift of architecture. As each HL is an image, each activation is also an image. Now let's look at this function, this equation based on this idea. So HL minus 1 J is the J image of neurons in the L minus 1 layer, and that's convolved with a kernel and I basically have a different kernel for each image in the same layer. And I basically sum them up to get the activation of ALK. And this activation is, again, an image of, uh, image of activations. Now, there is a separate convolutional kernel linking images in HL minus, J, uh, HL minus 1J to ALK. So this is, instead of now having a single value, as it was in the fully connected layers. I now have a convolution kernel that links images at different layers. And importantly, the same kernel applies to the entire image of neurons. So I don't have a single weight per neuron. Instead, I have a single kernel per an image of neurons. In the literature, this H LJs are actually called channels. And WLKJ are simply convolutional filters. Nonlinearities, as I said, basically remain exactly the same. So let's try to see what happens graphically a little bit better. In the fully connected network, I basically had this vector of neurons, and this formed a layer. In the convolutional network, Instead, I have an image of neurons, and it does not form a layer, it forms a channel. If I stack different channels together, now I get a layer. So effectively, this entire stack of images or of channels correspond to, to this layer. So in the fully correct, again, a layer was formed of vector of neurons, while in the convolutional architecture, a layer is formed of vector of channels. Now, analogy is that each neuron becomes a channel. So each of these neurons really correspond to an entire image of neurons, if you want to build the analogy between fully connected and convolutional layers. And likewise, each different neuron, they will all correspond to a different image of channel, a different uh, channel in a convolutional architecture. Now, a simpler representation that's used quite often in the literature is a tensor representation. In the fully connected, I had this vector representation. I simply put together all the neurons in a layer and call them, uh, if they're D sub L neurons, then basically I have a vector of size D sub L. Uh, 
In the convolutional architecture, I have a tensor representation where I have D sub L channels. And each channel has a size of M sub L times N sub L. So each channel is an image. And in a layer, I have D sub L channels. So this tensor corresponds to this vector if you want to build the analogy between fully connected and convolutional architectures. Let's see a video of how this actually um, plays out. Maybe it will make it a bit clearer for you to understand. On a convolutional network, I start from an image. And let's assume that I start from this image of a car. Now, a convolutional layer basically uses a kernel and places the 3 by 3 kernel, for instance, across all the areas in the image and computes the result of the convolution. One kernel will give me a channel, a convolutional result, but I apply the same operation, convolution, multiple kernels. And that would give me a stack of channels. And the stack of channels is a, a layer in the convolutional architecture. Now, we can even simplify further representation and simply use the same structure. So in the fully connected layer, we use this representation to denote a layer. And in the convolution architecture, we can also do the same. The difference here is, here I have a neuron. And in total, I have these about neurons. Here, this is a channel. So this is an image of neurons. And I have these about of them as well. And using this representation, the connections can also look very similar. So in this representation, each of these neurons were connected to every neuron in the next layer. So for this neuron, this neuron was connected to all of them. And the connections was basically through the weights of the connection matrix. And each of these operations corresponds to a multiplication with the weight and the neuron value and then I sum them up and I add a bias to get the value of this neuron. Here it's a bit different. Again, they're all connected, but each of these connections is a convolution. Remember, this is an image of neurons. This image of neurons is convolved with the kernel that links this guy to this guy. And this is convolved with another kernel and so on. And then I do the same. I basically sum the results of the convolutions and add a bias term to get to get the image of neurons in this um, in this channel here. And each of these convolution each of these kernels are different from each other. They're specialized to connect this channel to this channel. If I were to look at a different channel in the next layer, that would be connected with another set of kernels to the same neurons, again, different. And you can imagine, you can see that actually the structure here is very much similar to the structure here, except we go from neuron to channel and the connections are not multiplication with a weight vector, but instead um, convolution with a kernel. Now, how does the connection actually work in this case, in terms of the neurons? Because we said that each of these channels are formed by image of neurons. Now, if we were to open up, let's assume that I have only three channels in a given layer, and I'm trying to understand its connection to a single channel in the next layer. So I have, in the L minus one layer, I have one, two, three channels. And then I'm looking how, it's, how they are connected to the kth channel in the L layer, in the next layer. Now, this picture simply shows that there's a convolution kernel from here to here, but it doesn't really show how the neurons are connected. This picture shows how actually the neurons are connected. Now, in these cases, the red uh, neurons are connected to the red neuron in this channel. So I basically convolve, when I do the convolution, I basically multiply all these nine pixels with a three by three kernel, sum them up, and that will contribute to the value here. I use another kernel to do the same thing here, and sum them up, and that will also contribute to the value here. And likewise, these nine pixels also contribute to the value here. Now, if I want to understand which neurons contribute to this guy, to the blue guy in the L channel, I simply have to only look up and see that 
So there's another set of nine pixels in each channel that contribute to the value here. And the separation, so basically notice that this pixel is not actually connected to every other pixel in this uh, in these channels. It's only connected to these nine pixels, uh, to these nine neurons in this channel, to these nine neurons in this channel, and to these nine neurons in this channel. Likewise, this blue pixel is only connected to these nine, these nine, and these nine. And likewise, this green neuron is only connected to these nine neurons, these nine neurons, and these nine neurons. And the connections are defined by the kernels. Now, what is important here is that I basically use exactly the same kernel to connect neurons here to neurons here. So the contribution of these red neurons to this one is modulated by the same weight as the contribution of these green neurons to the green neuron here. So the weights are shared across the channel. But in different channels, different weights are used. Here I have K1, K2, and K3 kernels. So the same filter is used for all neurons in the channel, and this is what's called weight sharing. And this weight sharing is the essential component that reduces the number of parameters required in a convolutional layer. Because right now it looks like I basically increase the number of neurons substantially. Before, I basically had a neuron um, that corresponds to each of these boxes. So in a hidden layer, I only had D sub L neurons. But here, I have D sub L channels, and each of these channels have M sub L, N sub L neurons. So in total, I have a lot of neurons. But because they use wave cherry, we will see that the number of parameters required are much less. So let's look at this in depth, layer size and number of parameters at the beginning. Let's see what they are. Now, in a fully connected layer, I basically, if I start with an n sub zero, m sub zero image, um, in a fully connected layer, let me assume that I'm actually going to a hidden layer of size d sub one. That will give me a weight matrix of d sub one times n sub zero times m sub zero. In a convolutional layer, now the same structure, so a hidden layer of d sub 1 channels will have d sub 1 times n sub 1 times m sub 1 neurons. So the number of neurons or the dimension of the hidden layer is much, much, much higher. Instead of having a weight matrix, I have basically a set of kernels. Now, each of these kernels, again, are responsible for linking x to one of the channels in the hidden layer. So there's d sub 1 weight, weight uh, kernels. If I assume a kernel size of k sub 1 and k sub 2, then the number of weights required per convolution kernel is k sub 1 times k sub 2. So if I want to compute the dimension of this entire weight or entire set of convolution kernels, it will be d sub 1 times k sub 1 times k sub 2. Now notice how the number of required weights decreased. Here I had d sub 1 times n sub 0 times m sub 0. Here I have d sub 1 times k sub 1 and k sub 2. So if I have an image of 64 by 64, this will be d sub 1 times 64 squared. But if I use 3 by 3 kernels to process that image in a neural network in convolutional architecture, then I will simply have d sub 1 times 9 weights. So that's a huge reduction. So layers, larger layers, so notice that the number of neurons in each hidden layer is much, much, much larger. So I have much larger layers, but they have sparser connections, so much lower number of parameters. Now, in the naive approach, graphically what this means is that a fully connected layer will take x, and for each pixel, it will connect, uh, for each neuron in a hidden layer, it will connect this hidden layer to everything else. Okay? And this everything else means that it will actually use a different weight for each of these connections. In a convolutional architecture, this will not be the case. 
each neuron in a hidden layer will actually only be connected to a certain part of the image. And I will share weights. So connection between these pixels to this neuron is modulated by a certain number of weights, a certain weight. And I will basically use exactly the same weights to modulate the connection between these pixels and this neuron here. An important point here is I have much larger hidden layers. So for an image like this, right, I basically had D1 number of neurons in a fully connected architecture. And here I have D1 times N1 times M1. Now, we basically talk about um, an important thing about the reduction of information. We said that we've seen pre in the previous week that a fully connected image, the fully connected neural network, if the hidden layer dimension is lower, then it might not be able to represent complex decision boundaries. So keeping the hidden dimension large is actually helpful to design, uh, to be able to represent complex decision boundaries. And here in the convolutional architecture, I basically have a huge hidden layer in size. So I don't reduce the dimension of the input. So that's quite good. And I do this without actually increasing the number of neurons. And that's, I, I do this without increasing the number of parameters. And that's crucial as well. And this only becomes possible through weight sharing. With this, I will stop this part here and I will continue um, in the next part.